How's my time? Good morning, good morning. How's everybody doing? Welcome to First Pentecostal Church this morning. We're doing something very special this morning. Across the way in our gymnasium, we got donuts, and we're, we're doing all of our Faith and Life Group celebration today. But live over there right now, they're interviewing some of our Faith and Life Group leaders, and so we want to bring that live to you on our screen. And uh, Michael Senna is over there, Pastor Michael Senna, and he's going to be doing that. So just tune in just for a second. He's fixed, we're fixing to go that way in three Two, Good morning, one. everybody. We are live today because we want to do something special as we conclude our spring semester faith and life groups. My name is Michael. I'm the youth pastor here at First Church. And right now we are celebrating with donuts, kolaches, and coffee here in the gym as we get ready for worship. But before we get started, we're going to go uh, start talking to some life group leaders and we're going to start talking about some of the things that they experienced in their life group and talk about a little bit about what they did and how their semester went. We're looking forward to kicking off our fall semester, September 4th. Please do not forget that we'll be doing that in the fall. At this moment, Brother Steven's coming. He's leading the life group. And Brother Steven, thank you for joining us today. We're live online and in the sanctuary as people are getting ready for worship. So what first question is, what? about well our life group was called fathers father knows best and father knows best was um dads and their young boys and we did a lot of fun activities uh, we went and fished we had a nerf gun war uh, and it was just a wonderful time for dads and kids to bond bond with each other bond with the kids and we really had a great time that's awesome that's so awesome i think when we make time for family and when it has to do within a life group uh, connection. You're not just connecting with your own family, but with other other families as well. So what what watermark moment can you kind of think back of what took place during your life group that really made a difference uh, in your life, in your family, or in other families? Right. Well, I think getting together with folks that you don't normally interact with, folks at church uh, that you don't always get a chance to be with and, and just naturally, you know, maybe they sit on the other side of the church. And so it was just kind of a bonding moment where you see them worshiping on Sunday, and that's great. But it was a chance to really connect with them in a social way. And the kids, I, I know for myself and I think for the kids also, they felt more connected uh, just to their church buddies and people that you see from a distance. But again, you don't always get that connection maybe at a church service. Um, and so it was, it was just wonderful to have that closer feel and, and just bring everybody together. And uh, I think that was probably the biggest benefit. That's great. I think even you each other, past years of doing faith and life groups has been a great way of making friendships, building uh, uh, bridges and a bond that you would never really build just passing by. Thank you so much for joining us. I, we appreciate it. We're so glad that you guys have done a life group this year. Hopefully, y'all do one next semester. It's going to be great. Yes, sir. Thank you. Awesome. Don't forget, camp is right around the corner. If you have not registered for camp, register online. All the information you need is fpclakecharles.com forward slash 
camps. Today is the important day that everybody needs to sign up for the dorms because we want to fill them up with anybody that we have connected to our church. And we're looking forward. At this moment, we've got Alicia coming here today. Alicia, thank you for joining us this morning. It's so awesome to celebrate what God has kind of done this past semester. I was wondering if you could just talk about um, talk about what your life group name was, <laughs> what y'all did, um, and then we can go from there. Okay. It was a not-so-manic Monday, and it was just to be a group of encouragement for ladies to build each other up and pray for each other if we needed that. I think we all need that through our week, especially kicking it off on a Monday. That's so great, getting people together. So uh, uh, what's, uh, what's a positive thing that came out of this? Obviously, we're praying, but what can you call back to that has been such a positive impact in your life and your walk with God and maybe somebody in your life group? God has definitely showed how real he was. The way he ordained our meetings, we had two ladies come in. They gave their lives to the Lord. They got baptized with the Holy Spirit and in water. So it was amazing. It really was. And when we bring people to such an amazing choice and to see that happen through our life groups is the heartbeat of our life groups. And we want, we appreciate, are you planning on potentially hosting another life group in the fall? Um, probably. We're going to continue every other Mondays doing prayer. So, so even beyond our semester, y'all are going to still continue to meet. That's amazing. And that's what's wrong. We all build these connections with one another. We look forward to the next semester, and we hope that you continue to grow this group and see more people get baptized. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Finally, we have not the least but the best men's director over here. We are looking forward to such an amazing semester, but I, I personally have come to one of the meetings with Common Grounds Coffee Group, Brother Gary. About, about what are y'all doing in your life sure. and who's uh, we have a, a different age group now we started off with we would call it the silver cloud age 50 and above but thankfully we've incorporated a few of the younger ones but that's my goal for this fall semester is to include a lot more of the 30 year olds any age we'll take anybody now because we do it at the church not at a restaurant so we have plenty of room Every other Saturday, biscuits, coffee, and a lot of Jesus. So, yeah, any age, we're, I'm encouraging anybody to join up next semester. Absolutely. And the coffee and the snacks and the food is always excellent, but the connections that are being made. So uh, what has uh, been the greatest impact that you've noticed this past semester than other semesters that you've seen through, your, through this life group? Well, it's taken me several, not me, but it's taken our group several semesters to arrive at this point. But I call our group, I used to call them the crybabies because we would cry every other Saturday. But now I call them the hot group. That's honest, open, and transparent. And we have finally, after several semesters, got to that point. We talk about things that that's the only place that you can talk about things is in that group of men, knowing that what we talk about will stay right there and prayed over every day you have that need. So, yes, it's just a wonderful thing. That's powerful, being able to come together, not just be able to share each other's burdens, but pray about it. So thank you so much for being consistent. I think that's what's going to be key is staying consistent in leading your life group. Please be thinking about leading a life group. Please join the life group. We're going to be continuing to celebrate in the sanctuary as we kick off in just about two minutes. We want to take it back over there. We look forward to worshiping with you. God bless you.
of triumph hallelujah hallelujah it is so good to be in the house of the Lord today everybody said amen amen you may be seated thank you Jesus thank you Jesus I feel the electricity of the Holy Ghost in this place there's no telling what the Lord is about to do amen I feel an expectancy in the spirit. Amen. You know how we exercise that expectancy? We give. We give unto the Lord. And there's several ways that you can give today. You can go to fpclakecharles.com. You can give that way. You can give online. You can give on your way out the door today. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody say youth camps. I'm so excited, and then I'm a little, little, little weary because I know at the end of youth camps I'm really tired. But I'm so excited about what God's doing. You know, there's no other place in America where more people have received the Holy Ghost. Yeah, you can clap your hands. <laughs> Then the Louisiana District Youth Camp in Tioga, Louisiana. The deadline for registering is the 31st of this month. Uh, and today is the last day. Everybody say last day. If you have a, a, a young lady or a young man that wants to stay in the dorm, today's the last day to sign up. And the reason we're doing that is because we want to make room for other people. They, that We may have an evangelist somebody that needs a place for their child to stay in a dorm. And we want them to have a place to stay if we have availability, right? We don't just hoard God's blessings unto ourselves, do we? We want to bless somebody else. Amen. So God's been so good. Our faith in life groups this season has been remarkable. I mean... It has been amazing. And we have uh, a beautiful testimony that we've prepared today. It's a video just to share what God is doing in our faith and life groups. So as they, as they play this video, I want you to think about you. How can I be involved in a faith and life group? Amen? Amen, brother. Hi, my name is Courtney, and I've got an amazing story to share with you today. So a while back, I had a dentist appointment, and I went in, and as I sat down, I began to fill out the medical questionnaire. 
And immediately I was filled with guilt and shame and I didn't want to share my history on there. I didn't want to put my drug history. And in the end, I ended up putting it and I realized that it was a God thing because that day, Candace happened to be my dental hygienist. And so we got to talking and I got to share all the things that God has been doing in my life and all the things he delivered me from in my past. In the end, I got to invite her to church and to life group and they ended up coming to life group and they have become like a part of my family now. So I'm Candace. I'm Courtney's dental hygienist and friend. Um, the significance of her divulging her, her drug history is that two weeks prior to that, um, my sister moved down here from Wisconsin to be with me and she is also in recovery. If Courtney had not worked through that or felt moved by God to um, share her experience, then we would not be where we are today. Um, she invited us to church in life group. Life group was what has been life changing for me and my sister. Um, I just cannot say enough how um, wonderful the, this group of women have been to us. Uh, the reception from them has been so warm. Uh, non-judgmental you, you truly feel the love from them um, and it's a blessing it really is a blessing uh, I've been here for nine years lived in Lake Charles for nine years I have not attended a single church except for first Pentecostal and that is because this is now my church home and this is where we came to stay so um, I, I implore you all to to join a life group um, because it has significantly changed my life and I'm grateful. Hi, I'm Alicia. On March 20th of this year, my sister Candace and I came to church. We both received the Holy Ghost and were baptized that day because of Courtney inviting us to Life Group and church. Since then, I have a relationship with God. I, as a child, I believed in God, but never had a relationship with Him didn't realize there was a relationship to be had. It was something I was told to believe in, so I believed in. Life group was totally life-changing because now I don't have to struggle with my recovery on my own. The day I was baptized and received the Holy Ghost, I literally heard God tell me, I don't have to do this on my own. So, if you are not in a life group, join one next semester. Candace and Alicia, if you'd go ahead and stand up. Now, we have another special guest, too, all the way from Wisconsin. Their mother's here today in church with us this morning. Now that's what life groups can do. I'm... Freedom. 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 There's people that walk in this door today that are bound by chains. And we have the key. When we begin to lift up Jesus Christ and praise the Lord, go ahead and stand up with me. We're going to magnify the Lord in this place and we're going to break some chains this morning. Hallelujah. Worship as they sing.
Something right now, right now. He is up to something. He is up to something. God is doing something right now. He is up to something. He is saving something. God is doing something.
not a problem so small that Jesus can resolve. In time, he'll get involved. It's our God, he cares about us. So wait on the Lord. Wait.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your promise that you would never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you, Jesus, for your present help in the time of need. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, worship team, for all that you have done. What we feel now is not just a worship set. It's hearts that have set their heart to worship. And there's a big difference. Amen. I want you to greet your neighbor. Tell him you love him. Good to see him in the house of the Lord. Bless him. I see many a new face here today. We want to welcome you. We're glad that you're a part of First Pentecostal Church. Those of you that are watching us online, we welcome you as well. Just like we welcome this beautiful rain, thank God for a little moisture. Amen. The the glory of God has already visited this house. I don't know how you feel, but I feel uplifted in my spirit already, encouraged in the Lord. He was a surety to David. He is a surety unto us. He will not leave us nor forsake us. He is a present help in time of need. He is a tower unto the righteous. Amen. We've already purposed in our heart to have an effective summer. We're going to praise, we're going to focus, we're going to set our heart to the things of God. We're going to see the gospel take root. But as as expectation grows towards the summer, I do want to echo all that this pre-service conveyed and say thank you to all of our life group, faith and life group members, to all of those who worked so hard to make this semester productive. I am very, very happy that not only the fellowship component, which is important, was enacted, but also there were people added to the kingdom, added to the church through life group. Amen. And that is a, that is a meaningful thing. It means that we're in the will of God. Father, as we go to the word today, we pray that you would lay upon us a charge to preach without the fear or favor of men, but to hold true to the value that is the word of God, to build our lives upon principles that you spoke in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, to build our house upon your word and your nature, that we might glorify you in all things. And everyone say amen. You may be seated. I know that that there are services in which you preach a sermon. God lays upon your heart that purpose, but I am a pastor, and this is First Pentecostal Church, of which I pastor. And last week and this week, I'm going to take time just pastoring in the pulpit. We look forward to Brother Dylan being with us next week. Now that will be a sermon, but today I want to pastor. You'll pardon me for using a personal reference at the onset but it's the one I'm most comfortable with. And it's the one whereby this charge today that I'm going to relate to you came to me. My dad came to his commitment in the Lord while in Vietnam fighting the Viet Con. It had been a terrible night in which life and death hung in the balance of whoever wanted to live the most. My father won, and that next day he realized and understood that he would not make it out of that rice paddy if he did not have divine intervention. 
And so he committed, got down in the mud and made him, himself available to the cross. Way across the sea, in the middle of the night, the Lord had already prompted his mother, my grandmother, to get out of bed and get on her knees <laughs> where she prayed that God would save her son. When my dad came back from that war, he was filled with anger and rage that is necessary to fight a war. But he realized he could not raise a family if he did not put himself to the discipline of prayer. Early every day, so far as I can remember, he would make his way to the house of God before work. Three, four o'clock in the morning if necessary, but he would commit to pray. Most of you have never heard my dad pray. It is a terrible sight. He is loud. He is over the edge, but he connects quickly with his Savior. If the battle was really intense, he would also stop back by the house of God on the way home to once again renew himself in the power and in the spirit of God that he might war against his own nature and bring his nature under subjection so he could live a life of peace and harmony. That's my father. That what, that's what gave spiritual and physical awakening to me. I was born and raised in a home missions work. Very small church in a large town that did not have very many spirit-led or spirit-filled churches. So far as I know, in my high school, I was the only spirit-led person. Back in those days, at the age of one, you discontinued wearing shorts and you wore slacks or pants the rest of your life. When I was in high school, they called me the preacher man because I wore slacks and loafers every day. I wasn't called to preach. I just stood out. I was different. I had no choice. It's who I was. It wasn't good for me to say, well, this is my mom or dad's convictions. I had to stand on my own. So I learned at an early age to defend my faith, to say this is what I believe and this is why I believe it to almost have an offensive approach because it was necessary. I had no one that I could fist bump and say, man, that was a great service last night. No one. Out of hundreds and hundreds and thousands of students, I was the only one that wanted to be spirit-filled. So you can imagine the importance of having good church of what it meant on Sunday morning to come to the house of God and just be in the presence of God, to reaffirm. You take my understanding of prayer and you take my position on separation from the world and you understand where I come from. For me, the faith was always something to be fought for. Understanding Ephesians chapter 6 and putting on the whole armor of God was just something that I did because that's how I was begotten. It was only natural for me then to join the ranks of Bishop Morell Cornwell, a man who is so convincing in the faith, who is abrasive not only by nature but by principle of the gospel. It's just his nature to be that way. But he infringes upon anyone that will be in his association. Being drawn to that kind of authority, and being shaped and molded already prior to, it was only natural for me to join the ranks of his, of his spiritual approach, snatching souls out of hell's fire. That was the way I was raised. 
And that is the man that brought me into spiritual and apostolic authority. When we left to go to the the field to evangelize, he told me, he said, your victory on the field will determine your victory in pastoring. He laid upon me that charge. (laughs) When I entered into the field to evangelize, I understood that my future in the gospel was not out there somewhere, but that it was in the immediate That if I didn't have a breakthrough somehow in the now, I would never have a breakthrough. It charged me in prayer. It charged me in warfare. Many an hour I prayed in the house of God, asking him to somehow direct our paths. If souls were not born again in the altar, I was fuming and furious and angry because that's how I was developed. That's what was put into me at an early age. And it worked. It worked. My desperation, my passion, my warring spirit brought forth revival. When I came to pastor this church, I was on my way to preach another revival. I had no intentions of staying. The first day I was in this pulpit, the Spirit spoke to me and said, they need a pastor, not an evangelist. I told my wife, I said, we're moving on. We're going to San Antonio. It's already set up. That's where we're going, to do the work of God in San Antonio. But God had different plans. When I came here, I was abrasive because I was formed and fashioned in the desperation of revival, of passion to war. I didn't just worship God. I put on worship as an attitude to say to the enemy, I'm going to praise him no matter what you throw at me. I didn't just come to the church to pray. I come to pray through to a breakthrough. I didn't just fast. I fasted so that something would break in the atmosphere of my life. This is how I was forged in the fire of revival. It's been my attitude my whole life. So you can imagine, you can imagine what it must have been like for me on this past Tuesday as I drove out of, out of state to go give counsel to a pastor and his wife. Brother Rawson, what can we do? I'm on my way, heading down the interstate. When the Spirit speaks to me and says, you're not going in the capacity that you're used to. You're not going as a warrior. You're not going clothed in Ephesians chapter 6. You're going in Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Counselor, the Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. He said, you're going as an ambassador of the Prince of Peace. And I said, I don't know anything about peace. I'm a warrior. You got the wrong guy. I know how to worship until it breaks through. I know how to walk the aisle and, and, and pray. Eli Mohashata. That's my nature. And, and literally for 40 minutes, no No sound on the radio, no talk show. I just sat there, and he didn't say nothing, and I didn't say nothing. And he said to me at last, where did the wisdom of Solomon begin? Where did Solomon's wisdom arise from? And I thought, well, that seems to be where Solomon David, having faded from the scene and the throne now, belonging to him, wrestling in the night, says, Oh, God, these, your great people, are too much for me. Please give me wisdom that I can lead them. And God's saying, because you did not ask for victory and because you did not ask for fame or wealth, I will give you those things, but I will give you wisdom. And his wisdom was pronounced so that all the earth came to know him and and 
many other heads of state came to learn of him. The path of the stars, the way and the wonder of the seed in the earth. His understanding of love and the fullness of love. The queen of Egypt loaded down camels and crossed the sand, barren land and the wilderness to come. Learn of him and she sat at his table with many other noblemen. And heard him give counsel of all that he understood. And the depth was unsearchable. And when he entered into the worship and in the house of God, she literally said, it took my breath away. The volumes, the libraries, those things he wrote and recorded, they're, they're, they're unknown. They're so large and expensive. He wrote of love. The wonder between a man and a woman, young in love, tender in love, and the romance would make an old woman blush. Song of Solomon. Read it when you get home. Do not read it now. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. Is that where it began? And the answer is no. Because it's impossible to understand love. It's impossible to pursue a woman or as a woman to pursue a man if, in fact, you have to protect the border. It's impossible to spend hours building libraries and fill it with volumes of knowledge and understanding if you're having to prepare for war. It's impossible to plant fields and harvest crops and fill the barns in an hour of peace if a military might of substantial force is coming against you. It's one thing to have the queen of Egypt come with gifts. It's another thing to have her army pounding upon your border. Hear your pastor. The only way that Solomon can celebrate wisdom is because his father protected and built the perimeter. There is no statement of peace and the wealth of wisdom if there's not somebody to say to the enemy, we're finished. There's no more negotiating. We are strong, we are forceful, and we are powerful, and this is as far as you're going. The bloody sword of David gave rise to the peace of Solomon. There is no peace in Solomon's kingdom if there's not a bloody sword in the house of David. Now, let me make it practical for you right now, and some of you ain't going to like this. But the reason why America has a peaceful existence is because we bad to the bone. Now, you can say what you want to about our military might, but there's a reason why I stand and salute the flag. And that's because nobody's messing with us. Don't think they don't want to. They would love to. It doesn't matter who is in the office as president. We are as a nation understood in our sovereignty. You don't mess with America. Now, God might determine otherwise, right? But let me preach right now for just a little bit. If you want peace in your life, you have to set some perimeters. Right? You have to set some perimeters. There's a reason why some people are blessed. It's because they have determined with every ounce of their being that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of all. They have determined that there is no name that is above his name, that there is no power that is above his power. If you have that as your affirmation, if you have secured that boundary, you will know peace. As a matter of fact, he said the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Somebody say amen. amen. If you've made up your mind, if you have made up your mind that there is a necessity of separation from the world. I'm pastoring. You will have peace. If you're still courting the world, you will not have peace. And it needs to be understood. You're not at war with me. You're at war with God. 
He said, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. He said, I have made you the head and not the tail. He said, I want you to forsake country and kindred and family and follow me. He said, it is necessary to be holy and without such you will not see God. It's not a mandate of a church. It's a biblical mandate. And you will not have peace if you do not accept those terms. He, 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 didn't, he didn't argue. He just said, this is the way it is. He said, your body is not your own. Now, maybe you've taken that out of the Bible, but I haven't. I don't do things to this body because I'm telling you why. It's not mine. It's not mine. You do with it what you want, but I want peace and I want wisdom. So I set a perimeter. This body doesn't belong to this culture. It belongs to the Bible. This body doesn't belong to this world. It belongs to the Bible. This body doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. You're not going to have peace and you're not going to have wisdom if you don't set a perimeter in your life. You say, well, pastor, we're at war with you. No, you're at war with the word of God. I don't preach things that are not in the word of God. I don't get up here and say, hey, purple socks. If you don't got them on, you're in trouble. No, it's not in the word of God. People come in here with beards and mustaches, goatees that are sideways and upside down. I don't care. Whatever makes you feel like you belong somewhere. Doesn't matter to me. I don't care. I would to God you'd shave your head and grow just big chops. Come on, do something different. Doesn't matter to me because it's not in the word of God. It's not. So it don't matter to me. Right? But if it's in the word of God, it's going to be a perimeter. We're going to set it. We're going to say, as for me in my house, as for me in this church, there's lots of other places you can go, but I want peace. I want prosperity. I want harmony. I want love. I want wisdom. And he said, if you will secure my border, I will bless you. It's just the way it is. There's no changing that. It is not between me and you. It is between you and the word. So I'm sorry. I won't apologize. I'm not preaching philosophy. I'm not preaching a liquefied word. I'm not preaching something that is evolving. I'm preaching something that was before time began. And he said, heaven and earth shall pass away and the word of God shall stand. He said, you better find something that will not be destroyed and preach from that. Are we clear? I'm pastoring today, okay? We, we all right, bro? We all right, sis? We good? Now watch. Watch. So David secured the border. Set the perimeter. And Solomon understood the ways of peace. I said, oh God, this is awesome. I can preach this. He said, it's going to get more complicated. So, there came a time when kings, 2 Samuel, chapter 11, kings go to war, and David stayed back. In the spring of the year, when kings count the cost and send their armies to battle, David said to Joab, you go ahead. I think I'll stay. In the evening time, he looked over and saw Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop, sent one of his servants to secure her, brought her back, and he committed a great evil. He sent her back home, and she sent word, David, I am a child. He went even further 
and sent messages to the front line and said, send back, if you will, her husband. When he came back, he fed him a great meal, gave him a little bit of wine, encouraged him as to the the war and the battle, and then said to him, why don't you go home and enjoy your wife? Go home and and just fellowship with your family. But even in his uh, state of slumber, he, he, he stepped outside, Uriah did, and he said, how can I go enjoy peace when my brothers are at war? Word came back and they told David, they said, David, he didn't go back to his wife. He stayed at the king's gate and slept. David said, bring him in. He wrote a note and said, give this to the commander when you get there. How noble is this man that he put the note in his pocket, never looked at it. And the note said, put him on the front line in the heat of the battle. That day in the heat of battle, a sword ripped through his heart. He folded and fell. His wife mourned his death, and after she had finished mourning, David brought her in, and all seemed to be well. But God began to talk to me about something that's really important. Watch. Watch. David is the only one that has a passion, a strength, and an energy to secure the border when he's a young man standing in the valley. No sword, just a slingshot and a stone. And he runs yelling and screaming, who do you think you are to defile the living God of Israel? And the stone buried deep in the forehead of Goliath and that giant toppled. And from that moment on, every son of Israel was drawn into the magnitude of David. And David built, hear me, David built a process. He built and developed giant killers. He had himself an army of giant slayers. They were city takers and giant slayers. He developed a perimeter. He developed a force, a might, so powerful that no one would dare fight him, even come and march against his border. But watch, now David sends the army and himself retreats back. And literally at Reba, the battle is raging on one front, while he, in principle, is protecting his border, in practice, he's committing sin. The Lord spoke to me and said, you be careful that you don't build a church of warriors and become comfortable with sin in your own nature, Jeff. You understand, we're right there. We're having an outbreak of the Holy Ghost. It is my passion, my passion that our infinite, that our kid zone, that our hyphen have a move of God every time they come together. It is the will of God that we as a church baptize somebody every single week of the year. It is the will of God that we have outpourings of the Holy Ghost all throughout this campus seven days a week. That is a perimeter that I want with every ounce of my being. You understand? That's something I'm going to fight for. I'm going to have a passion with. I'm going to do my best to secure. But you hear your pastor. It is possible to have a revival church and a backslidden home. It's possible to have a perimeter pursuing church and a heart satisfied with sin. (laughs) It's possible to say, yes, FPC is where I go and we're having a move of God, but your marriage be on the rocks. (laughs) 
And so I have to come back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't want to, no, 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 no. I, I just can't preach about the next six months being profound. I, I just can't get up here and talk about, okay, this is the summer and we're about to have a move of God. I got to come back and say, hold on a second. I want there to be signs following believers every single service. Right? Right? But I want every man and woman in this room to practice peace for your home. Peace for your relationship with God individually. Because I can't gain the whole world and lose my soul. Because I can't preach a gospel and myself be damned. Pastor, how do we avoid it? There's two things that happen. Two things that happen. Right? If you go and read... Psalms chapter 32. You'll see the Psalms written while David lingers a year in the quietness of his sin. Put for me on the screen if you would. Psalms chapter 32, verses 3 and 4. These two verses speak of the nature of his heart. The Bible says... That he has, he has brought Bathsheba into his council. He has, he has quieted any possible echo of his sin throughout his staff and throughout all of those that serve him. And now he feels like perhaps it's been taken care of. But then there's something uh, that's going on inside him. He said, when I kept silent, he said, my bones grew old. <laughs> he said, through my groaning all the day long. He said, I didn't say a word. He said, but everything inside of me was screaming. You're not right with God. 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 The first thing we have to do is awaken that inner voice. The first thing we have to do is make sure that my conscience is loud and vocal and out front. The first thing I have to do is come in and say, it can't just be a good day. We can't just have good church. Have I done? anything in my private world that might in any way interfere with the presence of God in my life. Can I tell you, let me be the first one in the altar every morning. Let me be the first one as your bishop right here saying, oh God, oh God, my bones are telling me, repent Jeffrey, give your heart to God, give your life to Jesus Christ, turn your heart around and face him in his goodness and be redeemed. We have a collective voice of praise that God, that God really wants to do a work with through the summer. We are going to, listen, we're going to have services in which I simply don't preach, just exhort a little bit because worship just begins to boil. Right? Don't you think we're due for that? Now, we're gonna, I'm going to guide that because you need that. You won't do it on your own. I'm going to guide that. But let me tell you something. The collective voice is not what I'm concerned about right now. It's the inner voice. Because there are people in this room today that you've been living in sin for six months. Matter of fact, while I'm over here worshiping this morning, the Spirit spoke to me and said, tell my people. There are a few here that I have tried to fill with the Holy Spirit, but they have denied me. Tell them, quench not the Holy Ghost. You just keep putting it off, whether in doubt, whether in fear, whatever. But I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is knocking on your door. Quit saying, well, it's for someone else or I need more answers or whatever. You know in your heart that God himself is drawing you to an altar. Not man, but God himself. But I want to take it a step further. There is a spirit of repentance 
that began in this service that began a few weeks ago. I preached I preached here in this pulpit on a Wednesday night to our youth that were graduating and a spirit of repentance was on me then. Glenn echoed it. It was here last week. It began when I did the foot washing. God said, I want to humble my people. And there are people in this room that God is saying to you. And he's been saying to you now for nearly a month. Get on your face before me and cry out that I might redeem you. But you will not move. You will not, you think it's between me and you. It's not between me and you. Humble yourself before the Lord. Make your confession known to him and see if the Lord will not forgive you. I know this is bold. I know it's unconventional. I'm pastoring this morning. And, and, and you know when I say I'm pastoring what's going to happen. But I'm telling you, thus saith the word of the Lord. Thus saith the word of the Lord. Your bones are tired, moaning and popping because there is sin in your heart that is not forgiven. And you can be a part of a church that is absolute in protecting the borders and be living with Bathsheba in sin. Put up there, if you would, the next verse. Watch what it says here. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Look, my vitality, it it speaks here and says in a different verse, a different manner, my moisture was turned into the drought of summer. He said, my sin was so heavy within me, I began to dehydrate. I was dry. If you're in a situation where you're in a church that has a well springing up, and yet you feel dry, there's a problem. There's a problem. <laughs> you know, you, I prayed earnestly. Oh. The second thing that we have to have, we have to listen to the bone. We have to listen to the drought within us. And the second thing we have to listen to is the, the prophetic. Here come the old prophet, Nathan. About a year after the sin, the baby's born and David and Bathsheba are quiet, wanting to celebrate, the kingdom celebrating, but David and Bathsheba both understanding that this was not conceived in the proper way. I understand all of our children here born, all of our children here born that are born in this kind of circumstance are precious. I dedicate them, I love them because life is important, right? This is strictly a biblical principle that is established through David and Bathsheba. David's looking out the same window for which he first viewed Bathsheba when he sees coming up the path the old prophet Nathan. You hear your pastor because I'm almost finished. Between setting the perimeter and the ushering in of peace, there's going to be opportunity for you to commit sin. The only thing that keeps you is you remaining tuned to the waxing old of your own bones and the drought of your own spirit and to the voice of the prophetic. Hear me between setting the perimeter and enduring peace is a prophetic voice. David said, Nathan, how are you? Oh, man of God, I don't know you tell me. There's a man that had an abundance of sheep and a friend came to visit him and not wanting to slay his many, he looked over at his neighbor who had one. 
David. And he reached across the fence and took the one, slayed it and fed his friend. And it grieved, it grieved the man. David rose from his throne, no doubt in suspicion, and said, great harm has been done. It should be paid back. And Nathan said, David, you are the man. And David said, I know. The old king of Israel took off his robe, got down on the ground and said, will I live or will I die? The prophet said, God has already put your sin behind you, but the child will not make it. I'm coming to a close. I want to tell you, my passion and my vision, God is granting to me. As we get into the next few months, God is going to give us tremendous services. Amen. As we enter into the fall, you're going to see this church just erupt. Yes. But it cannot be at the cost. It cannot be at the cost of hidden sin. Breaking our bones and dehydrating our soul. So from time to time, Nathan the prophet has got to stand and say, it's you. It's you. It's you. It's me standing in the need of prayer. It's you and me needing to revive ourselves in fasting, revive ourselves in commitment, not for the purpose of revival as a whole, but for the purpose of purifying our hearts. It's me and you. They need to go back and say, God, once again, I make a covenant between my eyes and this world. It's me and you that need to take off the garment of praise and instead put on the garment of repentance. Come and kneel and bow. Come and bend head at an altar and say, oh, Jesus, I don't want to be lost. That's still a really important prayer, isn't it? I don't want to be lost. You're not going to do it by yourself. Me and Shelly are going to be leaders not only in setting the perimeter of our church, but also in setting perimeter of our home. Stand with me.
He who knew no sin took upon himself our sin. Quietly gave himself to the cross. So even Christ humbled himself as we must humble ourselves. Our living example in all things did just what you're doing right now. It's a good thing. It's a meaningful thing. It's an important thing. Don't pray for your church. There'll be plenty of time to do that. Pray for yourself and pray for your family. Pray for your home and pray for your perimeter. What is your conscience saying now? Repent. Then repent. What are your bones telling you? (laughs) Just start praying until the moisture begins to come back into your soul. It shouldn't surprise us that the queen of Egypt wants to come and sit on our pew. It it shouldn't surprise us that they want to be a part of what God is doing in the house. But the only way it works is if we personally... Sir, ma'am, while you're praying now, would you open yourself up to the Holy Ghost? There's never a better time for you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost than this moment right now. In humility, he will clothe you. In humility, he will bless you. In humility, he will pour into you now. That's it in faith right now. Receive it. You can you can pray in humility. You can pray in brokenness. You can pray in the quietness of your heart and still receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's always, always our custom to pray with one another. And that's what we're going to do now, if you would. Husband and wife, friend to friend, find you somebody. Find you somebody. Confess your fault. Tell your friends, say, pray for me. Pray for me. I'm weak. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Don't be ashamed. Woo! God, I felt something shift right there in the Holy Ghost. I don't know, I don't know what just happened right there, but my God, I felt it. Shaka ya aha. Pray for me. Pray for me. Pray for me. Oh yeah, I said hi ha. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's flowing now. It's flowing now. Rock on Sunday, la ba la. 
that any should perish, but is long suffering to us were. Eager and willing to pour out upon us renewal and blessings. Clean out that old sister. Clean out that old well and talk to your innermost being. Just prophesy, say, spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Goodness and mercy, start following me again. Belief and confidence, start flowing through my life again. For this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will give myself, I will give myself to the Spirit. I will give myself to prayer and fasting. I will give myself to the way of the Lord. I will. I will remain in covenant. Not just. Not just for the benefit of kingdom advancement. For purpose of God. Satisfying my own heart. For he hath made me glad. He is the satisfier of my soul. He is the great treasure. (laughs) His presence is what I long for. If you've not been baptized in the name of Jesus, having your sins washed in the blood of the Lamb, today there's a, a voice in you that will not stop pestering you of your sin it's time to be baptized in his writings Paul admonished us and said baptism in part is for the cleansing of the conscience there's a reason why you haven't found peace and that's because your conscience will not stop today if there's a a person in here and you cannot find worship to be satisfying. You cannot find the Bible to be satisfying. You need something to come into your life. I would encourage you to start with baptism. No sin can remain in the blood of Jesus Christ. By faith in baptism, the old man is made new. So that's where I would start today. Jesus, we are committed to you, committed to your service in our lives, and we thank you for what you've done. We thank you for being so present. Oh, we pray as we go home that we would set this perimeter in our home, that husband and wife would have a conversation, that we would be real and open. Let tomorrow be a day of devotion. Let this week bear out some fruit of this service in a day of fasting. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Let the congregation say amen. God bless you. Greet your neighbor. Love on somebody. Tell them how much they mean to you. Let's have a great week of the Holy Ghost. Hello, Pastor Jeff Rawson here. Thank you for joining us for this broadcast. I pray the blessings of God upon you this week as you continue to strengthen yourself in Him. And as you continue in His blessings, I pray that you remember First Pentecostal Church. Bless us with your finances. Bless us with your prayer. Combine with us, link with us, partnership with us as we do our best to get the gospel out to the whole world. I pray again that God would bless you this week. Thank you for joining us.